So I, I welcome Martin Parr, and I also welcome photographers like Mark Neville, Julian Germain, Alessandro Vicentelli from the Baltic, Doug Alving from Norway, all came a long way here for this lecture, which is brand new and which will be delivered by Martin in a minute. When I thought about what should I say tonight in a very short introduction, I thought that there should be, that there are some luxury problems which are related with this exhibition. The first thing is that this lecture is sold out. The second luxury problem is that we have people who think that the exhibition is not big enough or not full enough and they are giving us gifts for Martin to fill up the exhibition. <laughs> and so I'm giving you <laughs> a gift by Mr. Tom Megle from Cartier to Martin. <laughs> so it's a growing exhibition. <laughs> And that's a luxury problem. And the third point is that we, have, we are looking for bad weather because when the weather is fine, we have, uh, well, we have visitors but not enough. So if we have bad weather, we have a lot of visitors. So referring to an old project of Martin, we are looking for bad weather. And the fourth and the last problem is that this, there's a summer party outside from the P1 and the decoration looks like a set for Martin's photographs. <laughs> and so we are very happy that he's here with us and that he's not outside taking more P1 photographs. Martin Park. Thank, thank you, Thomas, for this tray. I will ensure that it goes up uh, tomorrow as part of the exhibition. Thank you. So tonight I want to try and explain some of the thinking behind this exhibition and, and to really try and explain to you some of the, the ideas behind my collecting habit. And it is a habit indeed, and it's an addiction that I have, uh, which I cannot really stop. And since the invention of things like eBay, this habit has become accelerated. And uh, as well as eBay collecting from dealers, from other photographers, you, I'm going to try now and explain some of the logic. So we're going to start off by looking at uh, the postcards. This is the first section. Now, I've been collecting postcards for about um, 30, 40 years, in fact. I, it's probably the thing, out of all the things upstairs, that I collected earlier than anything else. And I love the postcard from the great postcard boom in particular. This is 1900 to 1915, the start of the First World War. And in Britain, and indeed in Germany, people then produced their own postcards, and uh, small photographers and small studios and people would send postcards to each other. Now, in those days, there used to be six deliveries a day of the post. So in the way now that you and I might text or send an email to agree to meet someone, in those days, you could actually send a postcard, and in the evening, you'd have a, a reply back from someone, and all these postcards would have to have an image on. Sometimes they were photographic, and really, if you like, the, the postcards that I'm going to show tonight are the photographic examples. And these show weird, odd, strange things that have happened and, of course, the ones you see here are all from Britain, but you could find the same equivalent uh, actually shown in Germany as well. This, you can see, is just at the start of the First World War, and it's an anti-German riot. I do apologize for that, but you can understand <laughs> in Peterborough, this is a town in the Midlands in Britain. And any event or any small thing that happened, uh, or a crash or a disaster, there would be a photographer along because... Nowadays, of course, if we hear about a war or a disaster, we can see the images on the television, we can see the images in the paper. In those days, the, the source where you would see the picture would be on the postcard. So the postcard, if you like, was, uh, had a currency before the actual days of the newspaper photograph. Here you see a drought. And here you see uh, a storm with a shipwreck. And this is what we call a Warner Gothard. This is a particular uh, photographer's studio in Barnsley, in the north of England, who made these montages of events. And they would be the first people that actually knocked on people's doors and would get photographs of the victims or the people who'd survived a disaster or an event and put all these together into a montage. So this is a brilliant artist, if you like, a montage artist. The purpose, of course, was to make a very commercial postcard. Here is another, uh, what we call Warner Gothard, this one showing a train crash. 
This is actually a postcard that would be sent to people who are on holiday, if you understand what I mean. So this is someone who would be sending a card to someone on holiday saying, this is during what we call mill weeks or wakes weeks. This is when people would be uh, going from one mill town in the north of England away on holiday, all in the same week, the whole week that the mill would shut down. There'd still be some people left in the town. They'd be sending a card saying, this is what you come back to next week. Uh, it's the clogs, the, the boots that people would wear in the, in the mills in the north of England. This, of course, is fancy dress. And many of these studios, photographic studios, did family portraits. And again, people would come in and have their photograph taken. This is a suffragette coming in to have her photograph taken. Suffragettes, of course, just to remind you, are the people, the women who were campaigning to get the vote for women. And now we go on to something German. Uh, and these are what I call the, the, the utopian cards produced particularly in DDR after the Second World War when they were rebuilding the old East Germany in particular. And I always think that these postcards look like they were done by Bescher students. They're very dry, they're very minimal. And the, the idea then was to try and demonstrate and show examples of the utopian society that were, they were trying to build in the 60s and 70s. But now, of course just a block of flats like this, would not be regarded as anything interesting or exciting. So these postcards take on and have a sort of new meaning when we look at them 30 or 40 years later. These, this is back in Britain now, uh, and this is a postcard from, this is a northern seaside resort, and this, of course, is done in the 60s, immediately after the 69, probably at the early 70s, after the moon landing, and here it's a local reference to the, uh, the fact that people had landed on the moon. This is a postcard from a southern American or southern European country, probably Italy or Portugal. And in the 60s and 70s, they also made these idealized views of couples and families looking perfectly beautiful, nothing wrong, sort of fantasy dream world. Families, the perfect family, This is a hand-colored black and white photograph, again, probably from the 1950s in Britain. And now we're moving on to American advertising postcards from the 70s. This, of course, would be seen now as a, as a very modern, or then as a very modern image. One thing that's fascinating about postcards, they're very ephemeral. You know, they date very quickly. So the things that we think are important now are often not important in years to come. For example, in Britain, uh, there used to be a lot of postcards of motorways, and now, uh, because the motorway is such a dull thing, you don't have any postcards anymore. So, in a sense, the, the social barometer that a postcard can illustrate about a society tells us as much about, say, a documentary photograph. And that, to me, is the key to why postcards are so fascinating and revealing. It is, of course, also the most democratic art form that we have. And the postcard is slowly dying because, of course, the... The, the email and the text is sort of slowly killing it, and people are less inclined to post images now to each other. But in its heyday, it was the ultimate notion of a democratic art form. There's a nice picture of a laundrette. This is a John Hine card. Uh, this is a particular studio that I got fascinated by, and I started to pick and buy uh, the postcards from these, and then went back and actually made prints. I think we'll see later some of the prints from John Hind images in, later on in this talk. Uh, here we have a postcard from a, a holiday camp. We have these strange institutions in Britain called holiday camps, and they're, they're run by a company called Butlins. And these came into their heyday in the 50s and 60s before people actually had their European holidays in Spain or holidays in the sun. And the postcards produced from them were taken on 5 by 4 predominantly by, um, this is done by Nagali. He's a German photographer. This British company employed German photographers because they're so brilliant technically. They're far more advanced than, than British photographers. And they made these big transparencies of these scenes. They're all staged, everything's set up, and they would combine what's already there with a staged version. Now this looks like almost, in the way it's staged, like a contemporary photograph. So one of the things that's fascinating about these postcards is that many of them refer to current contemporary trends in fine art photography. <laughs> I 
Uh, this is uh, from Britain. This is a sort of shopping center. And of course, these scenes now look very mundane and dull, but that's why I'm so intrigued by them. One of the projects, or one of the books that I published with Fiden was called Boring Postcards. And of all, of all the books I've ever done, this has been the most successful because it's so boring. <laughs> now we get into the, uh, the funky 70s and 80s. Now, one of the things, uh, as you go up into the show upstairs, one of the first objects that you'll see in this case is this super club size uh, bag of cheese, um, sort of, I don't know what we call them, crisps or something. And just to explain the reasoning behind this, when I was in America, I think about two years ago, I went to a hypermarket and I saw this huge bag of um, cheesy bits. It's the biggest bag of a snack bag that I've ever seen in my life. And I was so amazed by this. I decided, I must buy this. I must start a collection of big snack packs. <laughs> but since then, I've tried to find a snack pack as big as or even bigger than this, and I've never found one. So therefore, that's why it's a collection of one. <laughs> this, of course, is Mrs. Thatcher. Now, uh, I have to explain to you that uh, during her time, I really disliked Mrs. Thatcher intensely, as indeed a lot of my friends did. But I realized and understood that Mrs. Thatcher was an important politician, an iconic politician, and I was so amazed that anyone would actually buy an object or a plate or a mug with her image on, I perversely decided that I should start collecting Thatcher memorabilia myself. That's why I've got so much of this Thatcher memorabilia upstairs. So it's, it's brought on by perversion because of my hatred. It's like, a, it's like a therapeutic session. How do you get rid of your hatred of Mrs. Thatcher? Well, you buy the objects with her picture on or her image on, and that will help to cure you. But it hasn't. So if anyone's got any ideas as to what I should do next, please let me know. This is from Spitting Image. Spitting Image was a television show which sort of satirized Mrs. Thatcher, and they made this sort of cartoon character of her, and many of the things I have upstairs are from that as well. This, of course, is the Falkland Islands, and it's because of the Falklands that she, uh, she continued in power after the 92 election, and that was very annoying as well, so I have to show that too. Here's the um, 87 election. And this is a toilet paper. I have a nice collection of various um, dictators. I wouldn't call Mrs. Thatcher quite a dictator, but you know what I mean. She's going in that direction. Uh, but I have a lot of toilet paper of um, Saddam Hussein, bin Laden. And many of these, of course, are produced in America. Uh, not that Mrs. Thatcher's loo paper would have been produced in America. It's probably produced in Britain. And people would buy this toilet paper as a sort of novelty item. Now, in almost to sort of balance out Mrs. Thatcher uh, is the, my collection of miners' strike ephemera. Now, I, I just remind you, but in 84, 85 in Britain, we had the most um, incredible strike where the miners went on strike, and it really was Mrs. Thatcher versus the miners. And I've collected, predominantly from eBay sources, uh, the ephemera from the miners' strike. This, for example, is a series of posters. And these posters are quite rare, in fact, because, of course, these things get thrown away. People think wouldn't think that it would have any value in years to come. And that's what you see upstairs is a whole little wall of these minor strike posters. They probably mean more to someone who's British than to someone who's German. This, of course, is uh, a miners' food fund, a sort of uh, prize draw ticket, lottery ticket, 10p each. And this, of course, would be a, the because this is something you're not meant to keep. You meant, perhaps you're meant to keep a poster, but something like a draw ticket would automatically be thrown away. And one of the things that they did to raise money for the pits was to produce plates. So most of the collieries that were on strike would produce their own plate in a limited edition, say 500, and they were then able to sell these for, say, 25 pounds, 40 euros, whatever. And the money that these plates made was able to contribute to their strike fund. So that's why you see upstairs a wall of these miners' strike plates. And in a sense, they really do go with Mrs. Thatcher. They are the yin and yang of Britain in the 1980s, just to explain, if you like, their relationship. <clears throat> Here's another poster. And now we move on to uh, another dictator. 
This is Saddam Hussein, and I'm completely obsessed by the whole idea of the images that Saddam Hussein had printed on his watches, on his posters, and his clocks. This is quite... Saddam Hussein clocks are quite rare. Watches are much more common. It, I think if you see upstairs, someone told me today there's 66 watches in the cabinet, while I've only managed to track down maybe about four different clocks. Now, when I say track down, the only way you can really buy this stuff uh, is through eBay, or occasionally, some friends of mine, I'm in this agency called Magnum, many Magnum photographers go out and do war photography, and during the, the last, uh, not so much now, but during the time when you actually could get to Iraq and operate as a photojournalist, some of these photographers, my friends and colleagues, brought back things for me. This came from a, a photographer called Thomas Jorvac. I had to swap him a print for this in the end, by the way. But I thought it was a good deal. Now, this is another watch, but this is a watch with Gagarin on. You'll see the little Gagarin figure at the bottom there. And we're now back to... Uh, this is, if you like, the ultimate accolade to have a false, uh, a, a fake Rolex made in your name which is what this is. This is an early Saddam. Because as Saddam watches, you can trace the sort of history of Saddam because as his image changed, so the watches changed. This is, of course, a later Saddam watch. <laughs> uh, within about three days of his capture, these were available on eBay. Now, I do believe, I'm going to make a... a a brag now, which is a very dangerous thing to make because someone will tell you you're wrong, but I do believe I have the biggest collection of Saddam Hussein watches in the world because the only person who might have had more is Saddam himself, and we know that his collection is no longer with us because the only way that people could have got these is through eBay, and I've been following very carefully other people who buy Saddam Hussein watches on the few occasions when I've been either outbid or other people have bought similar watches, and there is no name that comes up, so I assume there's no other collector. So I'd love to start a collecting club of Saddam Hussein watches, but I don't think there's anyone else who would actually <laughs> join it. So if anyone volunteers for that, do let me know later. That's, I'm asking a lot of requests here. but uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can see this. This is a plate. Yes, you can see the plate there in its very beautiful box. This plate I actually bought in Dubai. And in fact, we're actually making a, a, a limited edition of the Par World book which is going to have a box like this with the book in and a signed plate of Mrs. Thatcher. Because my publisher and I, for the last two years, when we decided to do this, have been buying a particular plate, which is the most common one on eBay, and we're now up to, I think, number 48. We're going to make an addition of 50. And I've also bought from eBay uh, 65 Spice Girls chocolate bars. So each box will have a book and a signed plate of Mrs. Thatcher and a Spice Girls chocolate bar in a box like this. <laughs> now we come on to the 9-11 ephemera, uh, and these are carpets made in Afghanistan. There's a tradition of making what we call war rugs in Afghanistan, uh, and these depict normally the sort of uh, things like the, the, the war with Russia and uh, more recently uh, things like the 9-11, the Twin Towers. Now we're on to Saddam and bin Laden ephemera. And this keeps on going. The, why is it I'm so fascinated by this, the whole notion of Saddam and bin Laden? I think because they've become so famous. Uh, and uh, the funny thing is, I've got sort of ephemera and objects which both are genuinely celebrating these people, and at the same time from America, where, of course, it's lampooning and criticizing them. So I like the idea that these objects come from two sources, pro or against. This, of course, is... Um... <laughs> Thank you. This is an American dead or alive, you can see that's Bin Laden, and I think uh, that's Saddam. Uh, these, of course, came from eBay and were very cheap. They were only like $30 each, but the postage cost as much. <laughs> but I haven't seen them since. I think there are a very small number of these made, and then they just sort of disappeared. This is 9-11. Uh, this actually plays God Bless America. It's a wind-up um, sort of clockwork thing with the famous iconic picture of the flag with the fireman. And this is a genuinely bought in uh, Pakistan uh, bin Laden kulfi balls. In Pakistan, of course, bin Laden is a bit of a national hero, and these would have been literally made and manufactured 
in the way that we might buy Mickey Mouse uh, chewing gum, they would find that Bin Laden coffee balls sell more than just coffee balls with no one on. So these are very difficult to find and locate. This is a board game actually made in Malaysia, of all places. Now, when Saddam Hussein actually died, there was a wash of things on eBay. For, if you go onto eBay now and you put in ebay.com as opposed to .de, and you put in uh, Saddam Hussein, you probably get about 120 items. When he actually died, there was 1,200 items. This is my biggest buying opportunity of all when I was able to get things like this Malaysian board game, which for some reason people thought, well, now's the time to sell. Uh, so that's how I got a lot of this um, stuff. This is also from Malaysia. I don't know why Malaysia made this pro Saddam stuff. And this is a genuine target that I got, a friend of mine got me from America, uh, a gun target used in the gun club in America and has been genuinely shot at. We're coming now on to um, Sputnik and the uh, things from uh, Gagarin. Uh, Gagarin, for example, you have to understand, was probably the first real national live hero that uh, the Western world ever saw. So the way that Gagarin was worshipped and the amount of ephemera that was produced was much more than Beatles or Elvis. There's a colossal amount of stuff in Russia to celebrate this incredible achievement in the late 50s, 59, when they put the first man in space. Uh, and uh, a lot of the Sputnik even earlier, the mid-50s. Uh, and so there's an, a, a huge amount of material. And this, of course, um, now also surfaces uh, on eBay. And indeed, when I go to Moscow, uh, to the flea market there, that's when you're likely to pick up this stuff. And every, every sort of ordinary object that was available, from razors to shavers to rubbers to sweets, uh, had um, Sputnik motifs on. This, for example, is a razor. And here are the, the said Spice Girls chocolate bars that I referred to earlier. Now, I, sort of the Spice Girls are a more recent phenomena, and they're sort of, they, they feel so ephemeral and lightweight now that I sort of got drawn into some of the ridiculous things that the Spice Girls made, chocolate bars, perfume, tissues, cameras. It became obsessive, whereby almost every household object you build to get a Spice Girls version of it. Uh, and that's what fascinated me, I suppose. This, to me, is one of the greatest objects. The very idea of having a cup of tea with Coca-Cola <laughs> insignia on it is so insane as an idea. <laughs> so what is it that draws all these things together? In a sense, what I try to explain in the, in the text that I did to go with the book is that they are shadows of human folly. If you like, um, these are the people who are sort of mad dictators, uh, they're all representing huge iconic events. And what we have left when they have gone and the event has gone are these sort of objects that were produced in their honor, sometimes against them, sometimes for them. And it's the sort of whole idea of the human folly. So this whole notion of the object collection is about total human folly, if you understand what I mean. If I have to try and explain it, that's really, if you like, the thing that gets me excited. Is, uh, and of course, you have to remember also with my own photography, I'm collecting things and objects and people and making them into sets and trying to bring some order to it. So I, I see a lot of commonality between the work I do as a photographer and my work as a collector. Now we're coming on to trays. I just love the idea of the, the way that a photograph can function in a domestic situation and the very idea that people have to carry cups of tea or wine or whatever onto a tray and on these trays there are images and photographs, of course, that fascinates me, which is why I've been collecting trays with photographs on. And you'll see those, of course, as you go up the stairs. Many different types. This, for example, is the, um, the Moscow Hotel in Moscow, demolished, I think, about five years ago. I bought this tray just as the hotel was being demolished. Food. And now we're coming on to photographic books. This is perhaps my greatest love in terms of collecting, and uh, together with my colleague Jerry Badger, we've done a history of the photographic book in a two-volume set published by Feiden. And I think, um, as a photographer, I think one of the reasons why I was sort of motivated to try and do this is because I felt the status of the photography book 
had been sort of somewhat marginalized in our photographic culture. So one of the motives was to try and, if you like, give the book more status. Now, I'm a photographer. When I meet other photographers, we all know and understand that the information and the excitement that we've learned from the history of photography, if you like, is through seeing the book. So, if you like, to me, the thing that's inspired me more than anything else in my own reading of photography and the photographers I've discovered and the books that I've discovered is by looking at books. And I felt that this aspect of it, because photographic histories, which are very subjective, have been written by curators uh, and sort of academics who sit in their desks and wait for the world to pass by, hadn't really understood the importance of how the photography book operates within photographic culture. So that's why I was very happy uh, to sort of make this collection. It sort of started by accident and it's built up and that's why, in a sense, I strove or made it, it was determined to do this photographic collection book. And what we see upstairs are maybe 30, uh, is there 30 vitrines full of about 90 different books. So I'm just going to show you a few now. This, of course, is August Sander, until it's Zeit. 1929 was one of the key years in photography, particularly in Germany, uh, when this was published and the film and photo exhibition in Stuttgart was uh, also on and the Blossfeld book was published. It was you know, absolutely the key, the key time and year where everything came together, and Germany at that time was sort of leading, if you like, the modernist uh, notion of, of the virtues and the value of photography. So it's a fantastic moment in, in photographic history. This, of course, is Sander, who did this whole project about the different types of German people that you can find. This is Hans Belmer, Joy de la Poupe, published in the 30s. This is one of the books that actually had real photographs in, so it wasn't actually a published book per se, but it was actually made, and each copy, there's only 152 copies of this book, has actually the real photographs in. These beautiful hand-colored, wacky scenes of these dolls, which were sort of, if you like, so radically different to anything that had come before, uh, they were sort of quite unique and, and a trailblazer in terms of imagery. One of the great periods of photographic publishing was, uh, uh, was um, Russia in the 1930s. This is a book called Ten Years of Uzbekistan, with, uh, which was designed by Lisitsky. And it has this beautiful slipcase which opens up and then you see the book itself. All these books, of course, because they're fundamentally propaganda books for the Russian state, had to have the image of Stalin in. And you can see how he very cleverly made this silhouette cutout. And one of the things that was fascinating about the books in this time is that uh, many of the people that they showed were then uh, killed off by Stalin. And as this happened, you were obliged to keep your book up to date and also take the people out of your book. So this, for example, is one copy of Ten Years of Uzbekistan. And this is another where literally you see those four faces have been cut out because they've all been killed off by Stalin. Now, if you were found to have a copy of the book uh, where you weren't up to date, you too were liable for prosecution, possibly death. So owning a photographic book in those days, it was quite a dangerous thing to do. And likewise, you see the face on the bottom left there. That's been taken out because, again, instructions would have been given that this person no longer exists and he should be taken out of Russian history. This is a Danish photographer called Keld Helmer Pettersson, who in 1947 self-published this book called 122 Color Photographs, and it's probably the first intelligent book that actually showed color photography. He was a self-taught photographer. Uh, he, he managed to publish this himself, and he did these quite modernistic views of color images, uh, which really still now look quite fresh uh, and didn't have the sort of same pictorial sense that many of the color photographs taken in the 30s and 40s actually had. Perhaps the most influential photographic book from the last century was published in 1956 by William Klein. Uh, it's called New York, and he was able to use these really funky graphics. It was a city uh, book, of course. Uh, he was using the Vogue photocopier to produce this sort of uh, strong sense of design, and it had a profound effect whereby when photographers picked up this book, they too were influenced by this. 
So one of the things also that fascinates me is, is the ability to try and trace how other photographers were influenced by other people and how you can see the lineage of influence go through different communities and you can see how, say, in the 60s, a book would have been published in South America but also influenced by Klein's New York, which was originally published in France. It wasn't actually published in America. We're coming now on to more recent days. This is an artist book. Uh, this is Hans-Peter Feldman. He, of course, in the 70s, along with Ed Ruscha, started to make these small photographic books in the case here with Feldman. They were called Builder, where he would take one particular idea or notion. Let's look at this one here, which is, in fact, uh, ladies' knees. And he would do a series of photographs uh, of, say, 10 different knees and put them together into these little books. They're very conceptual, and it's this sort of conceptual thinking that we hadn't seen before within the strict photography world. Uh, and I think when people first saw these, they didn't quite know what to make of them, but more and more now we appreciate the achievements of Ruscha and Feldman, and, and now they are both celebrated for their, what they did, particularly with their photographic books. Here's another one. And this is just aeroplanes in the sky. Simple, beautiful and powerful, and uh, sort of nominal, hardly anything there. This is a company book, and um, one aspect of uh, the photographic collecting, or the photographic books that I've uh, been collecting, are photographers who've made company books. This is by William Eggleston. This is called Inside the House of Hanover, published in 89. And he had to make two books, or the design company in London had to make two books because it was a company that had a lot of dealings with South Africa, and they wanted to put the South African pictures, this is during the height of apartheid, as a separate thing because they didn't want to have the embarrassment of their South African uh, involvement being circulated with their main book. This is a Danish photojournalist called Kras Clement, uh, and uh, in the mid-90s, he came over to Ireland on a sort of scholarship, and he was living in a county called Monaghan, which is on the sort of border between the north of Ireland and the Republic. And one night he was driving out, and he came to this village called Drum, and he went into this pub, and uh, it was an amazingly archaic, feudal sort of pub, if you like, very traditional Irish. And he just photographed there. He had three rolls of film, and he just photographed. And he saw this one man in the middle and he sort of identified his own meliconia. He was quite depressed at the time and just photographed around this one man just with three rolls of film and later produced a very moving book. So what's amazing to me is this idea that sometimes a book can take 10 years, 50 years. Sometimes you can do it in an evening with three rolls of film. This is Raise a Laugh by Richard Billingham. We not only see that the original book Dummies of his work upstairs, but we also see some of the original prints and some of the smaller end prints uh, that were made. And in fact, Julian, who's down here, was one of the original uh, person, if you like, who discovered Richard, who was a student at Sunderland Art College. And then um, uh, he and a guy called Michael Collins made the dummy of this book, which then became published, and Richard Billingham is now very well established, and this body of work is uh, justifiably very well known. Billiam, just for those of you who don't know, was, uh, lived with very dysfunctional parents, and he just photographed uh, his family in the first instance to try and make studies for his own painting. He was a painting student, but then the actual photographs uh, became the thing itself, and in the end, he's known as a photographer rather than a painter. Now we're coming on to the, um, the prints that are in the exhibition, and there are two sections. There's international and British. We're going to first look now at the um, British section. British documentary photography in the last uh, 30, 40 years has been quite impressive, but it's not really collected or celebrated in the way that it could be, um, probably because uh, in Britain we don't quite love photography quite in the same way that you do in Germany, so that hasn't helped its sort of uh, promotion. And um, one of the things I've done is therefore build up a very good collection, or I've tried to build up a good collection of British photography of course, I know many of these colleagues of mine, they're, they're other photographers, and I've bought prints from or exchanged things. And uh, that's what you see upstairs, the evidence of, is, is this sort of collecting idea. And one of the things that I, inspired me to do this was the thinking that if I didn't do this, it wouldn't get collected in a proper sort of way, because there aren't uh, the public means of support for 
British photography to be collected in a bigger way as, as I think should be justified in Britain. This is Tony Ray Jones, one of my favorite photographers. He died very young in 72, but it was seeing a picture like this it got me very excited about photography way back in the early 70s. This is in Margate. And this is a Chris Killip photograph. And again, one of my early influences was seeing the body of work that Chris had done in the northeast of England in the uh, late 70s uh, when he got a, a fellowship to work in Newcastle. And he did this remarkable series of work. Uh, they were very different from what we'd seen before because all the nostalgia and whimsy had been taken out of the depiction of the working classes in the northeast. And instead, you have this very good quality because he shot them on large format cameras, and this sort of subjectivity and directness, which was very fresh and very commanding and very, you know, very, uh, to me, absolutely poignant. This is Graham Smith. Graham Smith and Chris Clip worked together, and he photographed in pubs in the northeast of England. He would actually go drinking and photograph at the same time and has produced a, a remarkable body of work on pub culture in the north of England. This is a John Davis photograph. John Davis is a, a very fine landscape photographer. Uh, this is almost like a gursky f type view where you see above the scene there's a football match going on there. You can see all the players, you can see the cars parked, you can see the people walking around and playing football. This is one of the John Hine pictures I referred to earlier. And um, when I sort of discovered these postcards, I got very excited and then about five years ago, decided to publish a book of these postcards and at the same time, we went back to the postcard company and said we would like to make editions of these prints. We found all the photographers, and uh, we have an agreement with them whereby they sign the prints. Although the copyright is owned by the company, they get a, a, a payment for, in fact, signing and producing these new images. And, of course, these photographers, as I say, two of which are German, one was English, were absolutely amazed that anyone would be interested in the photographs that they'd taken for commercial assignments 20, 30 years earlier, uh, and, and that, to me, to them, was a, a revelation. This is a photographer called Peter Mitchell. He was probably the first uh, color photographer who did very good color work in Britain. And this is one of... He makes sometimes these sort of wacky frames that go with his pictures. These are all shot in Leeds in the late 70s. And his first exhibition, which is called A New Refutation of Viking 4 Mission in 1979 at the Impressions Gallery, the idea being that someone had landed from Mars and had come down to look at this northern working-class town, and this is what he found, and he couldn't work out what these people were doing. So it's like a man from Mars looking at a northern town. This is a Tom Wood picture. He did a wonderful body of work uh, looking at the buses or looking at life in Liverpool from the bus. Not only did he take them on the bus, but of people on the buses, getting on the buses, so he did a whole body of work around the bus in Liverpool. This is Paul Graham. This is from his, one of his early projects called the A1. The A1 is a road that goes from between London and Edinburgh. It was almost before the motorway. It was like a fast main road up the, you know, the, main, the capital of Scotland to the capital of Britain or England. And he photographed around this road in the 1970s, or early 80s, in fact. This is Karen Knorr. She did a series of work called Belgravia, where she looked at the very rich middle classes, or upper classes, in fact, in this area called Belgravia in London. It's like Mayfair. It's a very expensive place. She was from that background and therefore had great access. And she combined this with quotes from the people with portraits. This is Keith Arnett. He's a very fine photographer. He was um, someone who was a sort of conceptual artist who worked in the 60s, was shown at the Tate, and then drifted into photography and also therefore into obscurity, but still kept up his conceptual bite. And this is some of his more recent work done in the 1980s. This is where he photographed uh, objects from his daily life. He went to the rubbish tip and found boxes, cardboard boxes that people had thrown away, and did a series of portraits of these. Very beautiful and very simple. This is the Billingham photograph, a big Billingham one that I referred to earlier from the Raise a Laugh project. This is someone called Elaine Constantine. Uh, she did this series of uh, what we call moshing. This is what we call, uh, this is when someone has passed literally around a nightclub or 
during a gig on the top of the audience like this. And she set up a fashion shoot uh, where all these people are actually wearing the clothes that are illustrated in the fashion shoot. But she made fashion look like documentary and documentary look like fashion. This is done in uh, the mid-90s for a magazine called The Face in Britain. This is Stephen Gill. He's a uh, sort of newer, younger photographer from Britain who's very interesting. And he did a series of portraits of uh, women with their shopping trolleys. This is Mark Neville, who also is here. And he did a project in uh, Port Glasgow, which is a suburb of Glasgow. And he um, produced a book, which was famously uh, only given out to the people in the actual town where they lived. So he made a book, 8,000 copies, delivered by the local football team. So the only people who ever found this book, who got this book, were the people who lived in Port Glasgow. And therefore, if you wanted to try and buy this book from anyone else, if you, the photographer's gallery or bookshop, it was not available. The idea being it was a public art project where the people who actually were the subject, if you like, were the people who would actually get the book that they were interested in. It's more complicated than that, but uh, <laughs> that's a brief summary, right? And this is one of the, the two pictures that I have, big prints from Mark's um, exhibition or set of pictures on Port Glasgow. All this is, by the way, lit uh, with a whole sort of bank of studio lights at the back, isn't it? Or lights that were flashed off. So as he flashed this, this dance, Christmas dance, just before Christmas, crazy big scene, uh, is like a studio that he lit up. This is Jem Southam, a, a landscape photographer. He did a whole series of rock slips and rock falls. This is done on the Isle of Wight where the, the, the coast or the rocks are slowly disintegrating into the sea and he would go along and photograph these. So the idea of that the, this is like, if you like a trace of movement in a landscape. And now we're coming on to the international section uh, this is Robert Frank, the Americans. I'm sure many people know this picture. Uh, and this is the first photographic book that I bought when I was at college in 1972. I've still got the original copy that I, that I had. So it's very nice for me to finally catch up and buy a vintage Robert Frank from that same book, which had so much influence on me when I was a student at college. This is a Friedlander. And I guess the people that influenced me outside of, say, Tony Ray Jones and Chris Killip were the American school of photographers, Winogrand, Freelander, Frank, uh, when I was a student. These, of course, we were seeing in Britain for the first time in the 70s, or, or, uh, and it was very exciting. And this is, if you like, how I got my sort of fixation on photography, by seeing these people. Cartier-Bresson, one of the great iconic pictures from him. This is Luigi Guri, a very interesting and important color photographer from Italy. If you like, probably along with Peter Mitchell, one of the first people to actually take color very seriously in, in Europe. You have to remember in the um, 70s, if you did color photography, it was really frowned upon. You know, if you were a serious photographer in the 70s, it should be done in black and white. So the very idea of people fighting this and doing, trying to do it in color was really you know, out of the ordinary then. Now, of course, it's never an issue whether you take color or black and white. This is a Winogrand. This is one of the pictures. What I've tried to do in the collecting of these pictures is try and locate the images that have had a big effect on me. And this is one of the pictures of Winogrand that I saw, which really drew me in. Likewise with the Cartier-Bresson on, on, uh, on, the, on the riverbank. So, you know, the pictures that you can't remember, or the pictures that you, can't, that you can really remember that had an effect on you, there, if you like, are the ones to sort of buy and aim for. This is a Gilles Perez picture done in Belfast of the Troubles. There's a whole little section upstairs, which you may have seen, where uh, there, there are photographs where they've been painted on with white sort of opaque paint. Uh, and this is a technique often used in press photography in the 50s, 60s, 70s, where if they wanted to block out one part, or in this case, they wanted just to show Roy Orbison's head, so they'd paint round it and then draw round it. But of course, I've collected the whole picture. So this I will eventually make into a book. I have about 200 of these photographs, and I keep trying to buy new ones. And uh, that's just one, if you like, tip of the iceberg. So often what you're seeing here is just one photograph from a very bigger collection from my terrible addiction with collecting. This is Heiner Blum. 
And I'm showing this because in the, this is taken in 81. In the early 80s, I saw this photograph and was very excited by the whole mix of flash and outside photography. And it was interesting that it was a German young photographer that inspired me to do this, which in fact led me, of course, because one of the things I do as a photographer is steal other people's ideas and try and make it my own. So I was very inspired to see this technique, and uh, I just want, that's why I wanted to show this particular picture. This is a David Goldblatt, South African photographer, wonderful documentary photographer, still going strong. He's uh, something like 76 now and still producing incredibly good imagery. And he's photographed the whole recent sort of troubled times in South Africa through now to the, in, in the reconciliation that we now know and see. This is Osama Kenemura, wonderful Japanese photographer, uh, landscape photographer, urban landscape, the chaos of the poles and everything like this in, in Tokyo. And I'm a great uh, believer in Japanese photography. They, they make not only very good books, but they have a... a sort of photographic culture which I find very engaging and often not as known or appreciated in Europe as it should be. This is uh, Yoshiyuku, uh, it did a series called uh, The Park where in, this, in the 80s he photographed with an infrared camera or infrared film and flash which meant that the flash was not visible to the human eye. So therefore he went into this park where people were having sex in Tokyo and did a series of photographs of people, you know, often mildly going about having sex, but people weren't able to see that they were being photographed. This is Frank Breuer. He's one of the last Bescher students from the Dusseldorf Academy and has done this very simple and wonderful series of work of warehouses, containers, uh, and this particular case you can see it's a Nike warehouse. Simple and bold, a bit like those Bescher or the postcards you saw of the Eastern Europe. The, the overlap, again, is quite interesting and significant. Hans Eichelboom, a Dutch photographer who does a series of like photo notes. If you like, it's a modern version of Hans-Peter Feldman where he takes one particular idea. And these are uh, office workers walking into the Twin Towers, but done a few years before its demise. Hans van der Meer, very good Dutch photographer who has photographed uh, football uh, as if it's a sort of social event rather than a sport. So he would take the context of showing the situation where the football is played, often in very lower division uh, teams. You can see around here hardly any uh, people actually supporting or watching the match. But it's a fantastic series which, which really showed you a different way of looking at football than other photographers have done. This is uh, Arasha Nasaho no, Arasha Nasahoka, Nashahoka, a Japanese photographer called Half Asleep, Half Awake in the Water, a series of work. And here she looks at the whole relationship between the sea, the water, and the land behind it, or in this particular case, an aeroplane. And now we're coming on to the final section, which is some of the, my own photographs. And uh, we decided in this exhibition that I should also have, a, if you like, uh, a slot. And this is a series, an ongoing series called Luxury, which is very much to do with people and money. One of the things I believe in the way that traditionally photographers have been attracted to poverty in, the, in a sort of socially concerned way, I'm attracted to wealth because I think wealth is equally as problematic as, pro as poverty. So I've taken it upon myself to find and photograph in different situations manifestations of people showing off their wealth. And what you see upstairs is, is, I think, 45 pictures. It's an ongoing project. I have yet to finish this. I'm continuing to shoot it, which is why there's no book of this project finished yet. But in two years' time, I'll produce a book with, say, 100 photographs. But, of course, what I'm looking for is people showing off their wealth. So it's very good for me to go to events like art events, art fairs. This is um, at uh, Basel, Miami. Uh, because this is a time where people actually like to sort of dress up, look posh, show off their wealth. Art, of course, is the most luxury, luxurious item that anyone can buy because, you know, it's very expensive. It doesn't have any function in your normal life. It's not like a car or a house. But, of course, the very fact that we're in the house to Kunst mean you're all art lovers. You understand why people, and I'm very glad that people buy art because it helps to me to survive as a photographer. <laughs> Uh, this is in Dubai. I mean, I've gone to a lot of the hot spots of the new world 
economy and order, if you like. And of course, one of the territories which is uh, coming on very strong economically is Dubai, where it is the fastest growing city in the world. So I went last year to twice to Dubai, first to the art fair, and then secondly to uh, the horse racing there. This is in fact a polo match in Dubai. This is in Durban in South Africa, and it's fascinating for me to, uh, to think about how to, what's going on in South Africa. So I went to the biggest race meeting in South Africa, which is called the Durban July, and to see and watch and witness what was going on. So you have the more traditional whites. Um, and then you also see the very wealthy blacks enjoying themselves. So this, this too is interesting. This is back in Britain. This is Ascot. Oh, here we have the... Um, I love this picture from Durban of, the, of a white girl actually serving some black women. This is back to um, Dubai. This is also in Dubai. And as I say, I, I think of myself almost as an anthropologist, and I'm going around uh, the world looking for situations and collecting images, and again, making them into a body of work, trying to make sense of it, and put it together into some sort of rational form. Skiing, of course, a great activity if you've got money. This is a bull in Cambridge. This is in, taken in Moscow. Moscow is a wonderful example of this new ostentatious attitude towards wealth, which is why I've been there a few times to photograph. This is in the Moscow Fashion Week, as is this, where it's quite the thing to bring along your pet and carry it around all night at a party. And this is, uh, in fact, the Moscow Millionaires Fair, which I went to last October. And it is, in fact, literally a trade show for millionaires where you can buy uh, a mobile phone with diamonds encrusted on it and, of course, any brand of car you want, new houses, furs, wines, everything you want. This is also in Moscow. This is in Paris at the fashion shows. This, by the way, is the wife of the deputy prime minister of Russia, in case you were wondering. <laughs> so that uh, concludes a sort of brief, if you like, tour of the exhibition upstairs, uh, just to try and give you some insight into what I've been trying to do and how I've been trying to organize that. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>
I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit more about uh, collecting books, uh, how you do it, are you on eBay all the time, <laughs> uh, publishers sending you the books, um, and how much money are you spending per month <laughs> or per day <laughs> on photographic books? No, okay. I mean, in fact, the, the book collecting is less to do with eBay, that's more to do with objects. Because, um, if you like, I've built up a series of correspondence. I mean, I, go, I travel a lot because of my work. I, I go to a lot of countries. And when you go to countries, you sort of meet photographers, you, you try and find book dealers, and you find out what's going on. And when I go to a new country or a country I don't know particularly that I know has got a photographic culture, and I've made it my business to go to most of the countries in the world which have some kind of distinct photographic culture, the first thing I'll ask the photographers when I meet them is, what are the books that I should be looking for from, from your country? Uh, or if I go to a dealer, I'll say, what are the books that I should be looking for? Because I don't know, because no one really knows out there what is going on. Because even since the volumes one and two have been published, I've found another 50 books that I think are phenomenal that I think should be in this history as well. And eventually, we may update it. But that's how you do it. It is literally by going around and asking. And you build up correspondence, you build up networks, and I've made it my business, if you like, to, um, to try and find out because no one else seems to be wanting to find out. So particularly countries like South America, even I confess that the South American um, uh, coverage in our volumes is rather poor. And I'm now helping a, a Spanish curator who's based in Madrid, the man who wrote originally um, Photographer Publica, uh, to, to, to do a book about the photographic books from South America. And so recently... You know, I go once a year to, say, South America. I always go to a country and try and find out more. I've been in Brazil recently. And uh, I realized then that I missed out on a massive amount of material. But through ignorance and just not knowing, because people don't know, and even in Brazil, you can go to four or five different sources, and even they won't know all the things that are going on in Brazil. So it, it's complicated, and that's what makes it so fascinating. So I think, for me, it, it's become a quest to try and, if you like, unlock the sort of mysteries of the past that have been published in photography. And, and it's just one of the things that I enjoy. And you do it through help with correspondence and other photographers. You know, there's no better way of finding out what a good book is by asking a photographer. So I always ask them first. But you're, aware, know, sorry? Sorry? But you're aware of the fact that you have made it much harder to collect books uh, through well, your I'm, books? I'm, <laughs> of course, I am aware <laughs> that the, the price of many of these books has gone up. But, uh, you know, that's not a reason not to do it, is it? <laughs> and uh, I fully understand that therefore my personal collection will be worth a lot more but in the end I'm, I want to have my public collection in you know my private collection in a public collection in the UK because there's no real place in Britain where you can see uh, uh, these photographic books so that's what will happen in the end so in the end I'll probably just give it all away because it's been the journey that's been the fun thing I have a question regarding uh, your own work. The very, very first uh, photo that you showed with this man with his shirt in front of the painting, it almost looks like a staged photo. So to which degree do you stage your photos or you don't stage your photos? No, I mean, that was one of those things, uh, you know, people often think that that was entirely staged. But in fact, that guy genuinely did come to the... It was the Dubai Art Fair. He was genuinely at the Art Fair. I was following him around. I was in discussion with him. And he just literally went through the fair, and when he, he literally stopped there, and I took the picture. So it wasn't actually set up. But, of course, he knew full well, if you wear a shirt like that at an art fair, you're going to get attention, you know. And, uh, you know, so it was a conscious decision on his part to sort of have a little joke, if you like, about the art world by wearing this particular shirt. And it was just amazing to find a painting that, co that so corresponded beautifully with his thing. But it genuinely did happen. It wasn't set up. And, of course, you know, if you're around long enough in the world, you know, these small coincidences will happen, you know, because um, that's what makes the world interesting, is these, it, it does literally happen like that, if you wait long enough. Um, uh, you haven't mentioned these little movies that were shown at the exhibition. Which? This, the movies that you made. Oh, yes. No, so I haven't. do they fit into your work? Is that related to collecting as well? <laughs> well, it's interesting because I started to make films because um, one of the things, if you go to something like Henley or a horse racing meeting, 
people get, you know, they're, they're drinking away. And you get this most bizarre conversations. I mean, wonderful conversations. So over the years when I've been photographing, I've often thought, well, sometimes the conversations I've had have been so funny and so engaging, perhaps I should start making films in order to record those. So that's literally how it started. It's a motivation for me to sort of, if you like, cover one aspect of what I do, which wasn't covered before if you have a, just a still photo. So then I got quite excited by this and sort of made it, for a few years, made a few films. And then someone invited me, like with the Graham, the John Shuttleworth film, to do the camera work on this. But since then, I haven't really done much, in fact, because uh, I'm so busy as a photographer. To actually raise money to make a film properly is a very difficult and complicated process. So I haven't, you know, I've tried with a producer to try and do that, but we've never really succeeded. So therefore, at the moment, it's on the back sort of boiler, but it's something I may return to in the future, because I love the idea of, you know, the challenge of making a film. It's much more difficult to edit. You, you know, I mean, it's a bigger thing to do than making a... It's much easier to make a, a book about still, with still photographs than to actually make a film. So it's there to do in the future, potentially. I like them very much. They're extremely funny. Oh, thank you. Um, I would like to know what you think about the size of photographs, because some German photographers make photographs bigger than even king-size beds. <laughs> and um, what is, is there an ideal size? And, and what do you think about these photographs which grow and grow and grow like mushrooms right now? <laughs> no, I think um, I mean, one of the things that's fascinating in the last 20 years is, is the fact that the art world has embraced photography. And that, of course, is a great benefit to everybody. The fact now we're in an art museum and we can show photography equally along with painting, sculpture, else. So I guess part of that sort of letting in the door has been the fact that photographs have become bigger, so they have more status, they have more scale, they can fill, as you well know, the downstairs in the House of Kunz, to fill that with photographs. You couldn't do it unless you had photographs that were three meters by two meters. And so therefore I think it's all part of the exploration of how you know, the art world has embraced photography. So I personally don't need to have my pictures so big, but they're, they're not exactly small. So I think perhaps there has been a, a sort of, you know, one way of photographers trying to say that we are part of the art world is to make their photographs big. But now that they have become part of the art world, perhaps they can relax and they'll become smaller again. Um, what is the future of the photo book? Is there a future? Is there something we still have to explore? Um, what kind of fields in terms of the photo book would, like, would you like to explore? Well, the amazing thing is that the photo book, uh, despite the internet and the fact that many pictures now are seen on the internet, the photo book, the hard copy of the physical thing, seems to be more popular and more successful now than ever before. First, you have to remember that the audience for photography is getting bigger all the time. Because everybody now has a camera. You have photo sharing sites like Flickr. Everyone's got a camera on their phone. So the, the, the audience for photography is substantially bigger than it was, say, 20 or 30 years ago. Therefore, the, the audience to buy books is even bigger. There are, of course, many more photographic books published than, than 10, 20 years ago. And most of these go unnoticed, but just occasionally you can hit the buttons and a book will become sort of cult or iconic. Then, of course, you have the books done by better-known photographers that are more, e or more likely to survive. But I think that the history and the future of the book are still in very good health, you know, and dis I'm, I'm even surprised myself. But I think it is to do with the fact that the audience is bigger and there's a desire, you know, people understand how democratic photography is, how accessible it is. And that, to me, is why, you know, the, one of the great virtues of photography and why it is such a successful, you know, art form, if you like, because it's so democratic and because anyone can do it. And it's so easy and so difficult at the same time. Well, I mean, the ideal photo book is something in your head where, you know, you, you think of an idea. I mean, I have an idea of how I'm going to publish luxury, you know, because it will be very luxurious. It's going to have gold around the edges, and it'll be in a, like an album. It'll look very expensive, even though it'll be perhaps cheaply made in China. That'll be ironic, of course. So I have an, you have an idea of how a book may function, but until you actually do it and see it, you don't quite know if it's ever going to work. Because most of the books, and I've done many books myself, I would say most of them are probably failures insofar that they haven't quite worked. Because when you get one that does work, 
you know it because it sort of hits a button that makes people want to buy it. It's a very difficult thing to make people want to buy a photo book. Even if you're a photographer and you love photography, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. It's to put out 35 euros to buy a book. Mr. Power, I have only one or two questions. <laughs> well, let's start with one and see how we get on with that congratulations one. Congratulations to your fabulous viewing. Sorry? The word congratulations oh, thank to you. your viewing, the people and so on. Did you also have made photos of birds or not? Of birds? Yes. You mean... Um, That's the first. <laughs> you the you went with your father. Uh, no, because my, my father is, a, just to explain the significance of this, my father was a very keen bird watcher, and I got my obsessive and genes. What will, what will but happen? no, I haven't done photographs of, of birds, All but right. I have often photographed bird watchers. But we can't see it. <laughs> but we, we can't see it here. No, no, it's not here. Not here. But where? <laughs> Sorry? We have, to go, we have to go to Great Britain. To see my photographs of bird watchers? Yes. <laughs> Um, I think they're in the, the retrospective book. All right. Yes, which I believe they have in the bookshop here. Yes. So you right. don't have to go to Great Britain. You can walk around the corner seen, I haven't seen to it. the shop. You are a good I'm glad promoter, to save you all that time. Marketing promoter. And one question. What will happen with your collection after you have left, left this, this area? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm Is there any gallery and... Museum in Great Britain, which is are interested in. Uh, I mean, I haven't negotiated that yet because I, <laughs> I still intend to keep going. But it, it is, I have to say, uh, when Thomas Westkey came to the house and to my studio in London, where these two things and and uh, we took everything away, I looked around the house and it felt the same. I mean, it was very worrying to think that uh, all those postcards, all those prints, all those books are gone, and I couldn't tell the difference. And I'm really scared when I get this lot back as to what I'm going to do with it. I mean, I've yet to think of a solution, so I have a couple of years while this show has its small tour to try and think more carefully about the eventual destination of this work. But in, in the end, certain of these collections I do want to keep in the public domain, you know, even, if, if, even if I have to give it away rather than sell it, because... Uh, I don't need the money, I guess, so there's no point in trying to sell it just for the sake of it. So, um, I mean, the postcards are going to the V&A, for example, but that's the only thing yet that I've determined. Everything else I've yet to sort out. I'm working on it. Why did you have one of your P1 photos removed from the exhibition? Why did I have what? One of your P1 photos. Uh, because I, I like the idea of having the very same place, the building, actually in the exhibition. I mean, I came to Munich to photograph the Oktoberfest. I went to the disco at P1, and some of those photos became part of the show. Because I like the idea of including Munich, which is a very wealthy city. Congratulations. You've all done very well for yourselves. I like the idea of including Munich in the exhibition. Yeah, but I meant, why did you have one of the photos removed? Uh, because there was a, there's a potential problem there, which we've yet to resolve. That's why, so I decided to take the photo out. <laughs> okay, thanks. <clears throat> Mr. Power, how many shoots do you need uh, so at the end you can show us one of uh, your photographs? How, oh, well, it's difficult to say. I mean, the luxury photographs upstairs, there are 45 pictures, and this took me uh, two to three years, maybe five, six years to accumulate, but it wasn't working just on that. It's something that goes on as you go along. But I guess in the end, you, you, you know, if you take 10 good photographs a year, you're, you've had a very good year. So you have to take a lot of pictures to get a good one. Well, it would be very boring for me to show you all the ones that are not so good. <laughs> It would take far too long. So I try and make the, the job easier by only trying to show you that some of the better ones. For, for example, this one of the uh, rich man in Moscow with his uh, little uh, dog. How many pictures did you uh, shoot? Uh, the man this? with the dog, maybe 
10, something like that. And then I went to the next man with the dog. <laughs> okay, a couple more questions. Um, my question actually follows on one earlier about how you were saying that your collections would then go into different museums, and you also referred to your practice as kind of anthropological, um, but I wondered if you could perhaps say a bit about what your relationship is to the museum as an institution, because it almost seems like the guy in the crazy shirt who then happened to stand in front of the similar looking painting, and you said, well, he knew that he would kind of go there. And so there seems a way in which, you know, you could be aware that this work is eventually going to end up in a museum. So would you consider a kind of intervention of sorts? Or what, what role does the museum play in your work? I mean, a museum is one of the avenues you have to give a platform to your work. And uh, when you have a beautiful museum like the Haus der Kunst with a, you know, a ready-made audience and a, an intelligent audience, it's a fantastic... It's a fantastic... Uh, <laughs> It's a fantastic way of showing the work. So, um, you know, when this invitation came from Thomas Wesky to do this exhibition, I thought, well, this would be a fantastic chance for me to actually, first off, to look at these collections and to understand where I got to, and for me to try and order and sort out what I'm trying to do to just try and distill the best pictures. So the museum is part, if you like, of the way that I operate. But I believe in high and low culture, so I'm equally as happy to have my photographs published in a cheap newspaper and to have them in the walls graced of a, of a very fine art gallery like this. I, I like the fact that photography is both high and low culture at the same time. That's one of the things I believe in. So um, the museum is just an integral part of, my, uh, of the way I get the work to the world, you know, so I'm very grateful for it. And of course, you know, the role of the museum helps to sort of build up your career and all that sort of stuff. You find an audience, and it all makes sense. So why wouldn't you put it on here? So I don't, in terms of the, your question about the man with the shirt and that relationship to that, I mean, that's part of the series of work that I've done about the art world, which is part of the bigger series. And of course, the art world pictures are by their nature quite mischievous. And why wouldn't it be? Because, you know, the art world is a funny old world and it, it deserves to be prodded and poked in the way that anything deserves to be prodded and poked. And I think they can take it. So I enjoy that sort of two-way prod, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> I'm still interested in your future um, and, think, <laughs> and thinking about birds and dogs. Uh, are there any assignments you would refuse? For instance, would you accept an assignment like to make uh, pornographic photographs? Would you accept an assignment for Playboy? I, I think I would not accept that. No, because um, why would I? No, I, I, in fact, That's a strange I strange mean, answer. I've, I've said before that I feel myself to be quite a promiscuous photographer, but in fact, pon doing pornography doesn't really interest me. Or doing nudes, in fact. In fact. Or birds. <laughs> uh, one more question, <laughs> I think. If there is one more. If there isn't, then... Um, oh, there's one at the back. I hope it's a good one, as it's the last one. Yes, I was just wondering, uh, I mean, you work both digitally and analog uh, with film, and how do you determine when to work, or how do you decide? Well, I think these work? days now, I almost exclusively shoot uh, digital. Occasionally, I shoot um, film, because it's a project that I started with film, and it makes more sense to finish it with film. But now, luxury, in fact, um, you know, is both analog and digital. Upstairs, you'll see digital pictures and analog pictures so that the two are now intermingled. So now, in future, I will just shoot digital. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.